panel discussion here. Um, I have a chair as well, but I'm not going to use it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't like six people, five chairs. That would have been fine. But um, what we're going to do here, we have about 25 minutes or so to discuss IoT profitability. Um, before we get into some of the questions, um, I can lead off with a question that I'm really much appreciating if I can get questions from the audience as well um, as we get into this. But before we do all that, I'd like to I'm happy to one of our speakers introduce themselves. Um, a couple of minutes each. We have Chris Dirkster from Samsung, Ludovic Kopere from Sony, um, John Sons to be from Ericsson, Molly Preston, AT&T, and down at the very end, Jim Hunter with Greenway, also representing the Ipsos Alliance. Okay, um, so um, quite a big panel. Let's see what everybody's like, background and quick bio is all about, and then we'll get into the question. <coughs> So, all right, my name is Chris Turkstra. Uh, I head up the uh, IoT. The microphone. Hello? Okay. Is this good? Can you hear us? Okay. My name is Chris Turkstra. I manage the uh, innovation lab for Samsung around IoT in the, in the uh, San Jose area. Um, we're really a shop that, uh, that is trying to create new products and new platforms, really, um, that, that end users <coughs> love. Um, and, and we're, we're uh, about product design, we're about technology, architecture, and really simplicity at the end of the day. Um, our role is to uh, create these new products, build them up, and bring them to, uh, to Samsung uh, headquarters where they will be uh, productized and introduced. So we spend a lot of time on IoT and trying to uh, cut through kind of all the hype and noise and try to make products that, that, uh, that people will pay money for uh, at the end of the day. So I'm happy to be on the panel. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. I am Ludovic from uh, Sony. So I'm based also in the neighbor of Samsung in the South area. I used to work in the headquarters in Tokyo and before that in London and New York. So I'm part of the growth and venturing team. So we look at startups for strategic partnership, investment, acquisitions, and also I work in the digital property, so patent licensing and how to develop or technology differentiation. And it's well, maybe people don't associate Sony with IoT so much because of our consumer devices. We have a lot of activities which are much more tightly connected with some of the IoT verticals, like in Japan, banking and insurance business, uh, solutions business for venues and stadiums and retail, of course, media, um, you know, music and video, and many others. So, one of my role is really to broadly uh, with, my, with my team at uh, how we can uh, inject uh, innovations and disruptions. And of course, IoT, not just the connectivity, but the software and applications, is a key uh, element which I think can bring value to both Sony and our consumers. Uh, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is John Sonstevi. Uh, with Ericsson, uh, Senior Director of Innovation and Business Development. Uh, lovely to be here. And uh, despite my Scandinavian surname, I'm actually uh, U.S.-based. Uh, don't live in Sweden. Um, our team uh, is an interesting team within Ericsson. Uh, we focus on um, really disruptive innovation from business model standpoint. Um, you know, with our uh, large customers like AT&T's of the world. Um, and then in, in lots of different segments in the IoT domain with transportation and connected cars, uh, smart grid and utilities and, and digital healthcare. Hey, good morning everyone. Thanks for attending. My name is Mally Preston. I'm with AT&T. Uh, AT&T has formed a new group called the Internet of Things Solutions Group uh, recently. We combined the legacy M2M Center of Excellence and our emerging device organization, which was consumer focused recently. To form a super group to be focused on IoT uh, and providing both solutions to the commercial uh, marketplace and the consumer in a kind of a holistic fashion. And our group's purpose really now these days is to cut through the hype as we've heard before uh, and really deliver a solution that is integrated and easy for a customer to hit the button on the commercial enterprise side. Good morning. My name is Jim Hunter. Um, I'm representing two entities today. The first is the IPSO Alliance. IPSO stands for the IP for Smart Objects. And really our goal is to ensure that as many products as possible recognize the value of being directly on IP and leveraging all of the standards that are out there through IETF, through W3C, through IEEE, to make it simple as an on-ramp to IoT straight from the IOP, IT, IT world. 
Um, secondly, I represent uh, Greenway Systems, where I'm chief scientist. Um, Greenway is an ingredient brand company. We build software and services that enable companies like Verizon, who just launched a, a product of ours uh, joint, jointly this last week, as well as we have products that are empowering uh, products today that are on store shelves at Home Depot and Lowe's. Uh, finally, um, just a little bit about me. I've got 22 years in a space called Connected Home, Smart Home, Home Automation. Uh, selling products, building products, building startups in the space. So this is really exciting for me, and I'm really glad to be on the panel this morning. All right, thank you very much. So I'll just go out there and ask, uh, is there a question already, a burning question in the audience? Because um, if there isn't, of course I've got one ready. <laughs> Nobody, uh, oh, here we go. I'm always pleased to not have to ask a question, so please. So uh, do we have, excuse, do we have a microphone for, oh, great, thank you. you wait for the microphone, please. Thank you. So there's been a lot of discussion about connected devices. There's been a lot of discussion about ecosystems, but it appears to me that everybody is building their own ecosystem. Is there any discussion at all about um, some way that all of these companies uh, come together in a common ecosystem um, that provides a, a greater benefit? Jim, would you like to kickstart that? And then, uh... Certainly. Uh, so you actually ask a fantastic question from my point, which is from a standards position. Standards help to make, uh, for example, the World Wide Web uh, something very real, move out of BBSs into something that was interactive so, so millions of companies could participate. So the standards work that's going on, both from the uh, IEEE, from the IETF, from what IPSO is doing, as well as standards going on within service <coughs> provider companies. For example, the Broadband Forum is working on something called CSDA. It's uh, basically, it stands for Control Signaling and Device Abstraction. And it's a way to actually manage the assets that are actually behind the CPE equipment, behind the edge in, in the home. So I think standards are a great step towards uh, getting to where there's a common language that all these devices, a common bus, all these things can communicate on. To answer your question from an AT&T perspective, we founded the Industrial Internet Consortium with about 70 other companies, IBM, GE, are on it, and it's really to d develop a standards-based approach. You know, it was talked about yesterday, if you were in the room with uh, Deutsche Telekom, was that there was not enough adoption of this within the commercial enterprise space, um, mainly because it's just the complexities are difficult. Those complexities are really born out of the lack of standards. So from a carrier perspective, when we go build a solution for a large commercial customer and there's no standards, uh, and then we want to go kind of do it to a similar thing in a similar vertical industry, uh, we kind of re have to reinvent the wheel and the customer gets to kind of dictate some of these things. It's going to be a lot easier for us to duplicate and scale a business to these billions of connections that we're all talking about if we apply that standard. So that's, we're also working on other forms within the vertical industries, right? Heavy equipment has their own vertical engine standards of reading the data off of that um, and then allowing each manufacturer to also adopt that. So we're leading the forefront of those things to try to help along, along with the ecosystem partners that we work with. Yeah, I think it's an excellent question. Uh, I'll echo what you both say about standards. I think that's very important. And why I think this is important is, I think really this is where the, the business value lies and, and the real opportunity is it's not just in, in specific verticals, but, but really across ecosystems and coming up with, with new models there, that uh, some of which we can think of today, and, and I'm sure many, many of which will be, be thought of in the future. So being able to do that with standards, you know, securely exposing and, and managing APIs in a very horizontal way and exchange between these ecosystems is, is key. I think the, uh, as we said, the good thing about standards is you have so many of them to choose from, right? And uh, I, I, nevertheless, I think the tremendous momentum in you know, Etsy, Info Alliance, ITU, all these recognized regional and worldwide bodies, which are trying to drive some even bottom up or top down approach to standardization. For example, Sony, one of the several companies here, a member of the 1 and 2M initiative, for instance. They also, in parallel, a lot of not really standardization body, more like industry groups. For example, the Qualcomm, Qualcomm Lab, Olsen Alliance, there is also, I think, one that Samsung is spearheading, and many others in specific verticals, in fact, which I mentioned others. Now, my, I meet startups every day, and on the consumer side, you see, you know, oh, a nice connected you know, toothbrush, a connected um, scale, a connected um, 
what, uh, what it is recently, um, uh, lighter for keep putting smoking, that's nice. And everybody's doing its own API, which makes sense. It's a lower cost. So how do you move through the consumer world from individual APIs, which are nice by themselves, to a more global and you know, uh, horizontal uh, set of devices that can communicate with each other? I still think there's a lot of work to be done by everybody in the value chain. And I'll just uh, add a little bit to that from uh, the perspective of uh, Samsung, I hope. Um, so I think that, you know, as, as we mentioned earlier, the great thing about standards, there's somebody to choose from. Um, what really matters is which ones get implemented and uh, across all the devices and, uh, and how, they, how they actually gain adoption. Um, so as, as, uh, as some of the other folks have mentioned, Samsung's involved in Thread. Uh, if you beat six, basically on top of Zigbee, uh, also involved in the Open Interconnect Consortium, I believe is the name of the, the uh, consortium, which is working with smart things on standardization. So I think that, that for Samsung, the challenge is really deciding which one of these approaches and technologies um, to implement in our products, in our dishwashers, in our TVs, in our fridges, and all these other devices, um, and uh, in, in making that consistent across uh, the devices that, that we ship is an extremely powerful thing. Um, and that's, uh, that's where we're trying to, to add it up. And, and again, to echo the point around consumer value prop, these, you know, in our, in our looks at this, uh, your garage door opener has an app, your, your, your TV has an app, you know, all these things have apps. There's about three or four before you just throw the phone down on the ground and, and stop using it. Um, and so this platform needs to exist. Um, and how it gets done is a very complex process and, and we'll all be working uh, against that. But we need to do it to achieve the, the, the vision of the value we want. Thank you. Okay, so so we have we have standards in place. Uh, we've got an interoperability working. We've got legacy systems connected. So um, apparently we have these trillions of dollars to be made for the next few years. Uh, and I like these numbers because they're very exciting, but not necessarily reflecting a very realistic amount of money that each one of you could be making, though. Um, where, where does the low-hanging fruit uh, lie? Is there any low-hanging fruit right now? And wh what is it that each one of the entities we have <coughs> here are um, enabling right now or in the, in the, in the short to midterm? I'm sure. You guys want to go the other direction? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the low-hanging fruit are, are really these, these simple devices that are connected that we control via our smartphones and, and are designed well and, and work together with, with other devices in a simple way. Um, beyond that, uh, you know, some other companies are, are more about recurring monthly revenue and subscription and, and those types of uh, things, and, and you'll see a lot of investment in those spaces as well. Um, uh, that those are kind of the easy things. I think the things that get harder are around data um, and being able to make things automatic across systems without uh, having to actually set up rules as users and, and these types of things. So those will be the things we'll get to. But for now, it's products and services at, at the very basic layer. I think the golden goose of um, trillions of dollars is still a little bit far away, but um, one thing, for example, that Sony does, and we just announced it a couple of weeks ago, we have, as I mentioned, uh, car insurance and financial technology arm in Japan, and we have been launching this uh, OBD2 type of uh, device, basically a peripheral you put in your car, and it's like pay as you drive. So if you drive well, then you get uh, discount insurance. If you drive very poorly, then you pay more in a very you know seamless fashion. So it's not a very sexy thing, maybe. It's not earth shattering, but it's a concrete implementation of something from an industry which is very long lasting and with very limited innovation from the IT or C perspective coming to something new. At the same time, um, I think whatever can exist here in Silicon Valley, and we are all geeks here in a good way, early adopters at least, may not translate easily to mass markets. If I ask my grandmother in France to, to use a connected scale or a connected you know, toothbrush again, not have anything against this, but it's, it's a big gap. So how as an individual company, as an industry group, as a bundle with operators, with cool services, we can make it as a, something which doesn't require a PhD to use? Yeah, I think the low-hanging fruit is uh, stuff that actually solves people and businesses' problems today, right? Uh, there's a lot of stuff out there that just does stuff for the sake of doing stuff, and, and that really doesn't resonate with, with consumers, right, with, with, with businesses. Um, you know, the, connected fork that I saw at CES, right? I mean, who really cares? <laughs> um, I mean, building on the, on the 
on that OBD2, right? So that's, that's a, for those of you who don't know, it's a port in your car or under your steering wheel uh, that if you have any kind of car, it's been around for, I don't know, 10 or 15 years or something, it has that, right? But uh, I'm a member of, of AAA, which uh, if you're not familiar, is the American Automobile Association. If the car breaks down, they come and tow you away after four hours or something. But, but the, yeah. But um, they, they, a year ago, they started introducing this, this OBD2 uh, dongle, they call it, where you could, you could buy for $70 a year, you could buy this OBD2 dongle, plug it in your car, and then use their app, and then you could see how much gas you had in your car, right? Or you could see where you are in your car. And, and there were niche markets, right, for, um, you know, hey, where are my kids in the car, right? So you could go in and do that. But uh, I was, I was kind of struck by, I got a promotion recently from them, it's, hey, instead of $70 a year, we'll give you this for free. And for free for the first years, the adoption really hasn't, hasn't taken up. So, you know, people aren't doing it just for the sake of doing it. But usage-based insurance is a great model, uh, except for me and the way I drive. But it's, it's a good model in general. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think the little hanging fruit is put yourself in, in your customer, your consumer shoes and business shoes and, and solve real problems. That are, I think Belkin actually mentioned something along those lines this morning, too. Yeah, so I'll answer this question from an industrial IoT perspective. Um, so I have the, the good fortune of meeting with companies, typically Global 2000 across the globe. And um, the low-hanging fruit uh, in the commercial side is there. Uh, the number one problem preventing companies from doing that typically is that IoT has a transformative effect on the business processes. They've worked so hard and Six Sigma and everything to standardize on. And so even though it's very, the literally the technologies, the, what the carriers have with the, with the uh, hardware manufacturers um, and, and, and software and, and, and open, uh, open API capabilities, you literally can connect machines today, get, them, get the data up in the cloud, orchestrate it, remotely manage the device for an asset that may cost a million dollars proactively, and you could do that really within three to four months. It, it's amazing what we can do today. You would think that most companies would jump on that, right? But they don't. And in, so that's the low-hanging fruit, really, from a commercial perspective. But it's getting companies to adopt what the change will affect their business, which is significant. Uh, that's not the way we do it. Uh, oh, it, it, how, is that data private to me? Is it being anonymized? You know, how is it being worked um, you know, through the system? There's a lot of complexities for these corporations to understand what the <coughs> impacts are, so it's all about risk mitigation that they work through and they'll spend a year working through some of those things. And that reduces the rate of adoption, even the low-hanging fruit. The apples, in my opinion, are rotting on the tree, uh, literally, uh, as corporations stall and try to work their way through it from a business process perspective and organizational change perspective. So I think that the most important factor about low-hanging fruit is you got to make sure it's something people want to eat. And I think that uh, there's some studies that are being done that kind of indicate there's a, a little bit of a backlash that's going on in the world of IoT, um, maybe a little bit of exhaustion. So for example, BI recently released a, a research report that said that over 50% of consumers that are out there actually only want to, the, the most uh, desired functionality is to control it with their smartphone. One of the lower desires on their list is something that's like automation. That's like 21% of people actually want an automated system. Translate that to a full system. So we're looking at, as you guys have, have said, point solutions, solve problems. What's also interesting is that over 50% of these same responders think that the current family of IoT products are gimmicky. And about 43% said they won't change the products they have today unless there's a very real value. And a lot of people are seeing real value as something that saves them money. So low-hanging fruit, in my opinion, and based on this in information, is something that will save the consumer's money. We're gonna have to revisit that connected cutlery product offering. <laughs> How fast you carve that turkey? <laughs> very, very interesting insight so far. So I'm looking for the question that's gonna make these people not want to answer it. So. Uh, do we have one? But that's a challenging one. Uh, thank you. Please give it a go. Uh, wait for the microphone. She's been doing that all week. So. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's going to be a challenging enough or not. But, um, so it seems like uh, people, you know, talk about 
no hanging fruits and what could be the kira up and you know what can really drive the customer adaptation. But it seems like you know, as you said, you know, most of the things are more like a gimmicky or more like kind of sharper image sky more kind of products that address certain small niche, but not necessarily like a really broad consumers. So do you think this is going to be the way that IoT is going to be? You know, it's not going to address like 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 smartphone. It's not a smartphone everybody have, but each application is going to be more like a niche, but it's like a collection of lots of niche applications. Or there's going to be somebody someday somebody finds a holy grail of killer app and then kind of dominate the market. What, what's your view on that? Like what is going to be the application kind of speciality? So, is there a single color app is the first question. Um, I think that one of the things that we can do is we can actually look back and learn from our history. Look at the computer industry and look at what had to happen to the computer industry for computers to become mainstream. There was a lot of, as you said, there was a lot of gimmicky solutions. There was a lot of niche solutions to connect to computers together. There's a lot of niche uh, value propositions for users of computers, you know, play games or, or use a calculator, right? It was very simple to begin with. And what had to happen was you had to kind of learn by doing. And I think that's what we're in right now, is we're learning by doing. Mm -hmm. And the challenge is, like the challenge that you have with any technology, there's not a platform that's actually ubiquitous yet. IP might be one of those platforms that would be that way. But all these companies that are signing up and coming into the crowdfunding spaces like Kickstarter, they're becoming more than they think they're becoming. They're becoming end-to-end -end service providers to the likes of Samsung with much smaller scale and much smaller ability to actually close the deals that they're actually signing up for. So you're gonna have, uh, as you had in the computer industry, as you had with any kind of connectivity between, um, I guess it's reducing the friction between consumers and technology, you're gonna have that continued challenge where you're going to have people step up with these ideas, and these ideas are going to be shot down by consumers, and we're going to learn by that and, and grow to the next level and the next level. I think we're in a natural phase of that growth, an early phase of that growth right now. Thanks. Um, yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good question, too. Um, you know, is there, a, is there a holy grail or, or pot of gold out there? Maybe. Um, they're, they're certainly uh, hard to find hard to come by. I'm still looking myself on how I can find that pot of gold. You know, I, I, think, I think some of the challenges are, you know, too often a lot of these companies and the people bringing solutions to market really are, are focusing on the technology. And at the end of the day, this is really not at all about the technology, right? It's about transformation. It's about transforming uh, business. Uh, you know, as you mentioned, it's about uh, transforming uh, people's lives and society. And so, like I said before, it's about, it's about solving problems. So it's about understanding your consumers. Um, I've started doing a little bit of an unscientific uh, poll in you know, talking with, with people who I meet uh, not in this industry and ask them you know, if they know about Internet of Things or what that means. And I, I counted about five or six people I did that to this week, and two of them had never even heard of the term. Uh, three people couldn't explain to me just what it was. There was only one person who sort of knew what it was. So I think like, we probably need to move on from that buzzword uh, as well. And I, I don't know what we call it, but again, it's about solving people's uh, problems at the end of the day. And I guess the, the last point um, to the business transformation side, I, I think for this, you know, you really need to use the lean uh, startup principles like uh, you know, Chris uh, talked about in his uh, keynote uh, yesterday. And I think that's imperative. You know, go test these processes and you can't use the typical KPIs, you can't use the typical processes and procedures to, to really bring this uh, IoT out to market. Uh, Chris, maybe a final comment from you because you discussed that need for an overarching platform that brings together apps, so like in services that might initially seem to be completely disjointed or disconnected. So. Sure. sure. So I think uh, yesterday we talked a little bit about the Gardner hype cycle, which is kind of a useful tool, sometimes kind of not. The point is, we, the people in this room, this community, this, this industry, are at the peak of inflated expectations right now. <laughs> um, and there is an inevitable trough of disillusionment um, that we will head into, and, and that's going to, to happen as we struggle and search and try to get platforms figured out to, to, to get to the, to the uh, consumer value and the, they call it the peak of the, uh, the uh, trough of enlightenment or, or slope, of enlightenment. slope of enlightenment. <laughs> that's, that's us. Um, we're about to go through that. And I think the key for us, we can do this quickly. Um, 
you know, with platforms, with the right products and with this iteration quickly, faster than people expect us to. Um, it, it, as folks, the technology, the process, the design patterns are there uh, to enable us to do it. So I think that, that yeah, we're, we're going to, we're, we're, we will become Web 2.0 a, a little bit uh, at some point in some of these things. And, and, and the trick for us is really using the right type of tools and techniques um, to find that consumer value and transform these ideas and these technologies and products people love. Okay, um, I think we've run out of time. Um, I'd like to thank our panelists. Please. Thank you.